for allowing me to uh, invade your academic environment uh, for a while. I, I got a little glimpse at the course that you're involved in when Neil gave me a copy of the syllabus, and it really does seem like an excellent experience. Have you been enjoying it? It's a rhetorical question, but of course, when you're professors here, you don't have much in the way of alternatives. Um, I'd argue, though, that uh, the, the topic of death in the context of a traditional academic curriculum uh, has been much neglected, and that uh, I don't think you can consider yourself a properly educated individual uh, without coming to terms with, uh, both intellectually and emotionally, uh, with the notion of the inevitability of your own demise. And, and this was an issue that was of central concern, as Jim and Neil have pointed out, uh, of the late cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker in a variety of books, uh, starting with one called The Birth and Death of Meaning, written in 1962, and ending with Becker's untimely demise in 1975, uh, with a book called Escape from Evil. Becker was relentlessly preoccupied with trying to get us as individuals to understand the pervasive role uh, of the uniquely human awareness of death in all aspects of life. And so Becker was interested in death as something that's interesting and important for us as human beings to wonder about in its own right. But, but he had a broader interest. And in his language, he called it the general science of man. He wrote in very gender biased terms. These days, we'd call it humans to acknowledge the other half of the human species. But what Becker said is, hey, uh, it is the responsibility of social scientists from all of the disciplines, sociology, philosophy, history, uh, psychology, probably left a few out, but, but all of the sciences, he claimed, are, are responsible uh, for teaming up to provide us with a comprehensive account uh, of all aspects of human behavior. And, and for Becker, this was both an intellectual challenge as well as a personal one. Intellectually, he said, hey, just as we have a theory of evolution that helps us understand all of biology, and just as we have Einstein's relativity theory and now quantum mechanics from the physicist to help us understand all of the physical universe, that the social scientists should step up to the plate and provide us with a broad paradigm that helps us understand the basic nature of humankind. And that's exactly what Becker proceeded to do. And, and that's what I'd like to do today, is to tell you a little bit about his ideas. I had a handout floating around. Has everybody got a, a white piece of paper? Anybody not? Not, not? Uh, are there any extras floating about? If there are, let's see if we can get them to migrate over. Any, any extras of these? I kind of need this one. My talk's on the back of it. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to stray too far from uh, my prompting. So are, are there any of those? We can just float these around. No, that's not what I was hoping for. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, if we got another, let's float some of these things around. I'm going to refer to some of these things later. I don't want you to leave empty-handed so you can train your puppy or put one of these on the bottom of your birdcage. These things. OK, I'll let you guys work that out, but I will need you to refer to this white piece of paper at some point. Anyway, what Becker said is, look, uh, let's step back a little bit and, and try and think about what it is that renders human beings distinctly and uniquely different uh, from all other forms of life. And, and so uh, let me let you guys get into the action. If you had to think of a single attribute that differentiates us from lizards and potatoes, what would it be for you? <laughs> Anybody? Ooh, speech is good, and in order to talk, what do you need? Pardon me? Yeah, you need a vocabulary. In order to have that, uh, what do you need? Intelligence, good. How about the big brain, right? The fly's got a brain, but you can balance about 50,000 of them on the top of a pin. Uh, you have an enormous brain, not only in terms of volume, but uh, I'm sure do they study the convolutions of the brain, allowing us to stuff a lot into a small bowling ball-sized head, right? You know, yes? Yeah, no? All right, you know this. Uh, your brain, or you should know this, is, is relatively large compared to other living creatures. And I, I hope I'm not being too homocentric when I suggest to you uh, that human beings are imbued with a vast intelligence that renders us fundamentally different than all other living creatures. 
and that enables us to do things uh, without which we would not be here today. I would submit to you, first of all, that as a physical specimen, uh, each of you are pathetic and unable to function uh, in any autonomous sense on the virtue of your physical attributes, right? People are not large, we're not fast, our senses are terrible, you can't see shit, you can't smell, your teeth aren't sharp. If we dropped you in the middle of the Himalayas by yourself and told you to have a nice life, it would be a rather short one indeed, because none of us, a squirrel or a cockroach, would be fine. You would not be fine. And the reason is, is because biologically speaking, from an evolutionary perspective, we are not well adapted physically in order to stay alive. But rather what we do have going for us, as Darwin pointed out over a century ago, is our sublime ability to engage in sophisticated cognitive activities in the service of cooperating with each other in the development of an elaborate set of social institutions that uh, allows us to collectively continue to exist. Right? In very simple terms, we're smart. And that's why we're here. And there's two things that I'll mention about being smart that are real important with regard to why it's adaptive from an evolutionary perspective. Thing number one is being smart, interestingly enough, allows you in many situations to not behave, to stand back and say, whoa, wait a minute, this is an interesting situation. I've got to ponder what my options are here. So one of the things that Becker pointed out is that intelligence is not always directed at getting one to behave, but rather getting one to delay behavior long enough to ponder what the alternatives are. When a fly or uh, an insect sees a light bulb, what does it do? Flies right towards it. Doesn't have any choice. The behavior is instinctively determined. When you're stepping over a two-inch crack in a sidewalk, do you have a problem with that for the most part if you're not physically disabled? Right? You don't have any problem. You step over it. But you come to the next crack. You do that thing, step on the crack and break your mother's back. Right? So you step over it, next crack. All right, then you come to a point where you have a 100-yard wide pit of flaming oil. What do you do to that? You step over that? Maybe, but then that wouldn't work out too well. So you can say, whoa, wait a minute. Methinks that crack is slightly larger than the last one, and that if I continue to engage in a similar behavior, the outcome will not be positive. And so one thing that's claimed here is that our intelligence allows us to delay behaving in the service of choosing appropriate alternatives. It also does something even more striking. It, it, it allows us, and I would argue that we are unique to all life forms in this regard to actually imagine things that do not yet exist and then to have the audacity to transform our dreams into reality. Otto Rank, a psychoanalytical lunatic, said that only humans make the unreal real. Who drew the first pictures of helicopters? Yeah. Da Vinci, what year? Yeah, one of those years, a long time ago. Uh, and when Da Vinci's drawn pictures of helicopters, what are people saying? You're crazy. You're crazy. 500 years later, is that a long time in biologically speaking? Snap of a finger, the crazy man stuff got me here yesterday. So this picture in our minds is converted into reality. I hope you can realize the awesome adaptive potential of being able to dream about that which is not yet here and to make it real. Absolutely. To think that these guys are like flying pieces of wood. When they were trying to fly those little things, they were going, you can't people in the air. Nice. And that's correct. And that's nice. Or I wouldn't be here today, and I think that that's uh, important for us to think about. Yeah, well, maybe my bicycle would take me even longer than that, unless I caught a strong tailwind on my way out. All right, so now, let's just think about for a moment uh, the emotional consequences uh, of being so intelligent. And the guy who first started thinking about this, at least in Western thought, was the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard in the 1800s. Anybody hear, hear the name? I don't know. How do you pronounce it? Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard. Danish guy. Uh, and what Kierkegaard pointed out is that human beings are so intelligent that we become aware of the fact that we exist. In, in psychology, they call this notion self-consciousness. 